Today, as we continue in our weather unit, we're going to be talking about air masses. And air masses basically are large areas of air that have similar characteristics. We talked about this idea of weather being the atmospheric conditions in a certain area. So it would be basically a big mass of air, maybe covering hundreds, even thousands of miles with similar weather. Air masses can form in different areas around the globe, and they can actually change as they move across the globe. But typically, if we have warmer, moister air masses, they're formed in tropical regions near the equator, and cooler, drier air masses form in polar regions. We also have what's called a maritime air mass that would form over the ocean, and continental air masses that would form over large areas of land. As these air masses move, however, they can change based on the areas that they travel over. A dry continental air mass that moves out over the ocean would start to pick up water through evaporation, and it would turn into more of a maritime air mass. Likewise, something from the equator, a tropical air mass that moves north, would be cooled as it passes over cooler areas. Air masses don't sit in one place, they do constantly move around the planet, and that's because of wind. And wind is just the movement of air molecules. So as the wind blows, it's moving the air with it. And these air masses can travel as a result of wind currents. And we have a variety of wind currents all around the globe. Um, sometimes you might just have a windy day, but we also have more consistent wind currents that blow on a regular basis high up in the atmosphere that move our weather around the planet. And in the United States, the important wind currents are the prevailing westerlies, because the prevailing westerlies actually move weather from the west coast of the United States east. So when we name a wind current, we actually name it based on the direction that it's blowing from. The westerly wind blows from the west, and it blows weather to the east. There's also things like, you know, a southeast trade wind would blow from the southeast. An easterly would blow from the east to the west. So the name of the wind, the name of the air current, actually tells you its direction. The jet stream is a very important westerly air current in the United States. The jet stream is a fairly narrow but very fast moving air current that's pretty high up in the atmosphere and it pushes the weather that we have across the United States. So being on the East Coast, if we look at what's happening west, the jet stream over a period of, you know, maybe a few hours to a few days will move that weather toward us. Another important feature of the jet stream, though, is that it serves as a boundary between warmer air to the south, the tropical air, and the cooler polar air to the north. And the jet stream might shift periodically at different times in the year, but typically we can predict that any air masses or any weather north of the jet stream would be cooler, and air masses south of the jet stream would be warmer, because it does serve as that dividing boundary. As air masses move, they'll also move clouds with them. And we know from studying the water cycle that clouds are condensed water vapor up in the atmosphere. And we also know that as clouds collect enough water vapor, they'll eventually result in precipitation. So clouds can be a very good predictor of upcoming weather. And clouds will move with the air masses that they are a part of. Now when we look at clouds, there's numerous types of clouds. We're going to talk about a few of the most common major ones. But there are many, many types of clouds, and each have their own characteristics. Cirrus clouds are very high altitude clouds. They're kind of these thin, wispy clouds that you might see on a clear day well up in the sky. And these are usually predictors that you'll have very clear skies and fair weather. Stratus clouds are these long, gray, uniform clouds. They don't go very high into the atmosphere, but they stretch out a long way. And often they'll cover the entire sky. A lot of the time it might just result in a dark cloudy day, but sometimes these can also produce some periods of steady precipitation. Nimbostratus clouds don't stretch out as far as the stratus clouds do, but they're dark, really wet looking clouds. 
that typically will give us some pretty continuous periods of precipitation. Cumulus clouds are what we see when we think of the big white puffy clouds that look like cotton balls in the sky. And these are very large clouds. They hold a tremendous amount of water. And they also stretch very high up into the atmosphere. They're a very tall cloud. So these do have the potential over time to develop into storm clouds. But as long as the clouds are nice and white, it's usually going to be an indicator of a nice day. When these cumulus clouds do collect enough water, however, they begin to appear darker in the sky and turn into what are called cumulonimbus clouds. And cumulonimbus clouds are the tall, towering gray clouds that, again, they're fairly puffy, but they look much darker. And these will usually result in very heavy rain as well as severe weather and thunderstorms. Altocumulus clouds are these smaller gray puffy clouds, and they're made up of water droplets. And usually when we see these, we'll see them just covering the whole sky, lots of these small puffy clouds. And these can be an indicator of possibly, you know, rain or thunderstorms that would happen later in the day as more of this water condensed together to make larger storm clouds.